Good evening and welcome to our spring 2021 faculty lecture. Um, my name is Rachel Bergman. I'm the Dean of Visual and Performing Arts here at Sheridan College. And it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to um, remind you that we are still requiring masks on campus. So thank you all, you're all doing a fantastic job wearing your masks and wearing them over your nose. <laughs> and we also ask that you're spaced and we've got every other row blocked off and that you leave three seats in between your party and anybody um, outside of your party. So thank you. Um, welcome to the viewers that are watching via Zoom as well. Um, I wanted to thank the Thickman Lecture Endowment for its generous contribution to this faculty lecture series. The Sheridan College Faculty Lecture Series is designed to bring the scholarly expertise of NWCCD college faculty to the community. It has been funded by contributions to the College Foundation from Muriel and Seymour Thickman since 2007. So we are very grateful to them for funding this wonderful series. Um, so our speaker this evening, Brittany Denham, is a multidisciplinary artist born in California and raised in Wyoming. She received an MFA at the Ohio State University in 2012 and is currently gallery director and faculty of photography and printmaking here at Sheridan College. Her work has been exhibited nationally, including most recent, the arrival works by Brittany Denham at COS Gallery in Visalia, California, women's work at the Yellowstone Art Museum at, uh, in Billings, Montana, and Stay Home Gallery in Nashville, Tennessee. She also has an upcoming uh, exhibition at UCross, so stay tuned for that. Um, so it now gives me great pleasure to welcome Brittany Denham. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Oh my goodness, that's so loud. Okay. Um, so hi everybody, I'm Brittany. Um, thanks, Rachel. Um, I first wanted to thank um, the Cy Thickwin Endowment, um, as well as the Sheridan College Foundation um, and the Faculty Development Committee. So I, from the very beginning, when I started working at Sheridan College, I started really utilizing the foundation. Um, and I feel so thankful because they've helped me um, feel so supported in my, like, research, um, be it, you know, a workshop or um, just, yeah, everything new. And then that helps me bring it back into my classroom and teach my students. And so for that, I'm so grateful to the foundation. So from there, let's get started. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you guys about motherhood and art kind of the ideas behind um, why, why it is that this is something I started thinking about or researching. Um, we're constantly telling our students to be um, figuring out where your work lives, figuring out where it fits in the context of history, what the conversation is having with history, the theories that's supporting it, um, and also where it fits contemporary wise, right? Like who's making work like you're making work? So if I'm thinking about this all the time and preaching it in my classroom um, and utilizing that, it, it really hit me hard when I um, became pregnant um, in March, 2018. That's actually a Sheridan College baby bump selfie at about eight months. I had one more month to go. Um, that was, and then in uh, July, um, this is my kiddo, which I had him in May. Um, and then in August, this is my first piece of work that I made um, post baby. Uh, so the reason why I'm talking about this and why I was researching it is my work is severely autobiographical. I've always made work about myself. Most artists are narcissists. I will admit I am one often. Um, and so I was used to making work about my experience. 
But once I became a mother um, or I was pregnant, I was noticing I wasn't making work at all about being a mother, not one bit. And then when I was making it, it was like very quietly in my studio. I wasn't trying to like put it out in the world or make it noticeable. Like I kind of wanted to keep that separate, like my art practice and my motherhood separate. And so one day, um, I think I was talking to the painting professor here, David Brock, and I was making this stuff and it wasn't leaving my studio. And he was like, why? why are you doing that? Like, why are you, like, why is that not happening? Um, and also for myself, and I started really thinking about it, and I was like, well, I've only ever had three female professors. Of those three professors, none of them had children. I have even been actively told um, as a student that in order to be a serious artist, you shouldn't have children. Um, and so that's something I'd always wanted for myself. And so of course, once I got pregnant, um, I hit a pure crisis of like, oh God, like I'm not an artist anymore. How am I going to be an artist? Um, how do I keep them separate? But then also I'm trying to think about like, did I miss something? Like, yes, I only have these three professors, but like, why am I getting this message that I, sh that I shouldn't make work about being a mom? Um, and then I started feeding into my art history books and sliding into that information and research. Um, and that part was missing too. Um, so I'm sure I had some extra stuff in here about that. <laughs> oh yeah. So then at that same time that I was that pregnant, I was cold called by an artist named Lisa Lofgren. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of her, but so she um, operates and is the founder of Stay Together Press um, in Bloomington, Illinois. She's a printmaker um, and she is actually from the Buffalo area and she still has family there. So she had emailed me and was like, hey, I'm coming through the area. I had never seen her work. And she said, can I come talk to your students? And of course I said, absolutely. The more voices, the merrier. So she comes in. I still don't know really what her work is about or what she's kind of going to present about, but she comes into printmaking. I'm standing very pregnant in the back of the classroom. And she ta starts talking about the quickening, this body of work that she made while she was pregnant the crisis that she had while she was pregnant of like how to be a mother and an artist. Um, and I was like quietly standing back there, obviously very hormonal, but kind of sobbing um, and didn't want my students to see it. I was very quiet. Um, and once it was over, I was thanking her and she came to my studio and she saw what I had been making, which is all this stuff about motherhood. And she kind of came over to me at just the right time. The universe gave her to me and I believe that. And she said, um, hey, I, I see you. Um, and I think you need to look at a couple of these things, which was a great documentary um, called Artist's Mother by Jory Finkel. Um, and then a couple of other things. And then she was also presenting an amazing um, print exchange called Mother Matrix. And it was all about all like a bunch of mothers um, who were printmakers that she had put together in this collection um, to be viewed. And so again, holy moly, I had spent my whole life not seeing mothers as being represented. And all of a sudden, as I'm becoming a mother, she's put, just walked off the street into Wyoming, um, Sheridan, Wyoming. So I go back and I read through, um, kind of the things that was that were talked about in that documentary and that was kind of feeding my practice and edging me along um, to continue my art practice and making the work that I needed to make. So Jory Finkel said in this documentary, I sometimes joke that motherhood is the last taboo in contemporary art. Sex is not off limits. Politics is not off limits. 
And sometimes it seems that there's no topic off limits except for motherhood. There has not been one exhibition on motherhood in contemporary art. It's ironic that so few people have explored this theme of art when you look at the history of art. Holy moly, I'm not crazy. This is not all in my head. Um, and so these have become kind of the biggest questions that I ask myself, which is what does motherhood do to change the idea of what an artist is? And then what does the artist do to change the idea of what a mother is? So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking about this lecture. I was like, you know, I can't preach that mothers aren't seen if I don't really go back. So I go back to take out my history book of what I was taught. And I really look through what was being shown to me, all the readings, all the textbooks, try to figure out if and how the mother has been represented. So this is what we're used to seeing in art history, right? Um, so who is painting mothers, if we do see one? Admittingly, I am not an art historian, but again, I felt like something was missing. Most early Western representations we associate with seeing mother and child is the Madonna. And this imagery is central in art history. Predominantly made by men, we see cherub-like babies sitting quietly and the images are almost serene. I don't know how many of you have ever parented a toddler or a child of that size, um, but A, I don't see any like Cheerios present or snack packs or baby bags, right? I also have never had my toddler just stare gazingly up into my eyes while I'm sitting there reading a book. And I understand that that's like the not the context, right? That's not why these were being made. But again, this is like the visual I'm seeing in my art practice. So where do we start seeing the mother? And where do we start seeing how motherhood is actually portrayed? So when we get into the 19th century, painters like Mary Cassatt start painting children in like a more real life way. So kids are individuals. Um, it's almost as if like women are paying attention to the children and painting from the perspective of the mother. Although it's really strange because after digging and digging, Mary Cassatt actually never had children. Um, so it's said that she's per like painting from the perspective of like the maid's children. And so she's there, she's coming from like a very affluent life. And basically she doesn't have kids, but her maids do. And so she's painting her maid's children. Then um, in the 20th century, we finally see artists who are mothers themselves. Alice Neal's images come up with um, like a nude pregnant woman and they were really honest. So Alice Neal was great because she's like, she talks a lot, especially in the documentary from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, um, which is fantastic. You should all watch it. But she talks about painting humanity and painting what she sees. And then it's really important that the only time something is good, a painting, a writing, is that if it's from real, if it's from a real experience, and that this is as real as it gets, right? So uncomfortable. She even looks <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, and what's really interesting when I started doing this research um, is that this is actually her daughter-in-law. And she talks about um, Nancy, who is her daughter-in-law, as her best friend. She could not survive without Nancy. She was um, married to her son, Richard. Um, and then I also found, after watching and doing a lot of reading, in this painting, that portrait of that man looking in on Nancy is actually a portrait that Alice had painted of her son, Richard. So it's kind of like a family portrait. Um, which is odd. And I am really great friends with my mother-in-law, but I don't know if I'd want her to paint me in a reclining nude 
nine months pregnant, but she's seen some things too. So we see Nancy, we see Alice Neal, and then we move forward um, into the 60s and early 70s. The feminist movement gave rise to a group of women, feminists, who lived by the slogan, um, the personal is political. So one of the most important artists at this time was Mary Kelly and the postpartum document. So people can get pretty outraged by this one. Um, but what you're seeing is her, she, at the time she was really leaning on um, Jacques Lacan, who's a French psychoanalyst. She was leaning on his idea of um, basically our, our, our unconscious ways of connecting to our consciousness. It's really heavy, like further down the line. But so she's connecting with those ideas. And so how she's connecting with her child once it's born is she's having the child do drawings and then she's creating these columns and ways to analyze her children or her child at the time. Um, so, and then she also creates every letter, right? And then you've got the months. So every letter represents like a moment or a factor. And then wherever the child is coloring, she's able to analyze what her child is unconsciously becoming. <laughs> Heavy. And she also did some really great drawings or captures of her child's um, dirty diapers, which she then kind of contact printed onto paper and displayed those. Again, it's a way of having an idea of like, your experience and documenting it in a scientific way and connecting with it in that manner. Here's another example of her work. So I put this in because it's kind of um, reminiscent of what I'm experiencing now with my toddler. It says, Kay's aggressiveness has resurfaced and made me feel anxious about going to work. I can't count the number of small wounds I've got as a result of his throwing, kicks, biting, etc. I'm not the only object of his wrath, but I'm probably the source. Maybe I should stay home, but we need the money. So uh, I live with an almost three-year-old right now, and the amount of times that I get like punched or scratched or my dogs get their tails pulled, it's like you can't count it. So I wish I could tell Mary Kelly, like, it's okay. Like your child's not broken or just so aggressive. Like that, that's just every toddler. Um, and so, but she's collecting this data. And then we're moving again into that same vein, um, Senka Nangudi. And so you can see this at the Denver Art Museum right now. So her, her idea of relating to art and motherhood was the body. And so she's using sand um, to create kind of these ideas of elast elasticity and what our bodies go through through pregnancy. I um, mean, even the idea that as you stretch and as you're growing, um, sometimes you don't go back. And it's that same idea as <laughs> a lot of times you don't go back. But it's also along with the idea of like, that's also you as a human. Like as you go through parenthood and you're also growing with your child and you grow and you stretch and you change and, and you're not ever going to be the person that you were. We also see Carrie Bay Weems, who again has a totally different relationship to um, motherhood and how she's representing it in her work. And when I was studying photography, this was never, this was never like spoken about in context of like motherhood or her relationship to photography and motherhood. Um, but this was more so um, an idea of like the kitchen table as a battleground and the place where these relationships and communications take place, um, including being a parent, being a mother. Um, and she writes, uh, spacious, spaces of domesticity, a space is historically belonged to a woman and the site 
of the battleground that the family of the family. So and the idea of like how to alter the social contract that society has written. Okay, so moving closer to now, 2009, Rebecca Campbell talks a lot openly about how um, women and mothers have been um, disproportionately represented in galleries and how a lot of times when you tell somebody who's representing you a gallery or a museum that you are pregnant, they a lot of times drop you because they think that your um, priorities will change. Artistic endeavors are inherently selfish, right? So all of a sudden, if you're becoming a mother and you're trying to be selfless for a child, how do you then still be an artist? right, or a good artist. And so she talks a lot about this idea of, in this painting, um, she created the mother as having a third arm. Kind of that idea is like when you have a child, you need to become bigger and, you know, have that, have that, you don't lose something, you, you grow extra limbs. This was the first time I've also seen, which is really important in my work, and you'll see it further along in the talk. This is the first image I saw where a woman openly spoke about loss of a child. So she made this work, Art After Death, um, 2012, when after she had her twins, they were born way too early and she lost one of them. And she talks about that horrible feeling of going into a hospital room and, and you know, having one and being told that you, you don't have the other one and, and how she really struggled seeing that, that child that she still had because she had lost. Um, and so Rebecca Campbell started painting these beautiful still lifes um, that have this real darkness or this whole um, and them that represent the death of that child. So next, 2014, almost there, we've got Lenka Clayton. So she has been huge in my art practice. So her big, um, her big revelation is how she connects to other mothers. So she created something called an artist residency and motherhood for herself. Um, so artist residencies are very, very popular, but there's really not many for people with families, right? Um, it, they're kind of singular. And so it's really hard for people to leave their families for months at a time um, to go work on themselves. And so she noticed um, after she had a child, like she just couldn't stop making. And she was also trying to find a way to like keep making herself. And so she created um, kind of this set of rules for herself as an artist in residency in motherhood. So this is one of the projects she did while she was in residence as a mother, where she um, made all of the scissors in her home safer. So her and her husband are both makers. So I'm guessing they have a whole lot of scissors and she went through and, and made it so children couldn't hurt themselves. She also did a project um, where she had a hundred mothers send their like document, like minute by minute their entire day. So from 12 to 12, they documented every, every moment. So um, this is an example I'll let you read that for just a couple of seconds while I take a drink. Okay, so how this is seen so she types up the, the mothers, the hundred mothers from all over the world. 
and all ages, right? It could be a infant to a toddler. And she types up all of their um, days on these pieces of construction paper that fade, um, much like that day, right? In your whole parenting life. Um, and it's really about the, like not, like being able to see all the work that isn't seen. I know that doesn't make any sense, but it's like all the work you do as a parent that like you're not being paid for, right? So all the times you wash the clothes or all the times you get another drink of juice or the next chicken nugget you make, like none of that is being like recognized, right? Um, or even like all the falls and the kisses and then tucking in, like none of that is kind of documented and it just fades away. And then how this is seen is that she has three mothers sit in a gallery and they read at the same time um, the mother's day. And so they kind of, they'll sync up or they'll change or they'll run together and kind of you just hear that like just mumbling throughout the day, right? Okay, this is one of my favorites. She also created a series called 63 Objects I Pulled From My Son's Mouth. And it kind of made me feel not so bad. Sometimes like, well, at least my kid never ate a cigarette butt, so there's a win, right? But no mom shaming. Um, so I thought that one was really funny. And that brings me to my stuff. So the first way I ever, so again, doing all this research has really helped me, A, figure out how I'm relating to what's happening now. Also kind of give me permission to make the work that I need to make and kind of, not that we need permission to make work, right? But kind of make me feel like, who cares if, a gallery doesn't want me or a museum or whatever it is. Like, it's important that this is just documented in general. Um, so even if it's just for myself or now here with you. So the first way I ever see something is through photography. It's like my easiest, quickest way of making and getting something out there. Um, and so I started with this image. Um, and it's this little orange, like big, super cheap razor um, that was used um, during my birth. Not my birth, my son's birth. Um, but what happened is when I was in the, the delivery room, things were going south, had to go have a C-section and all like, th like the image that is seared into me is this, there was all this rush and commotion all around me. And all of a sudden they were like, all right, it's time, get out of the room. And I'm left with this like girl that looks about 13 years old. She's a C CNA, not even like a doctor or nurse. And she's got this tiny little razor and this um, like red solo cup. And she's like, yeah, I'm here to shave you. And I'm like naked and cold and shivering and terrified and crying and alone. And she's like, I'm here to shave you. And, and she was trying to like weirdly console me by being like, are you ready to meet him? While she's like shaving me. It was like the most like otherworldly experience. So of course I made an image of this glowing, like almost godly uh, Bic razor. By the way, it's going to get really personal really quickly. Um, it's really odd that I'm not able to get all your personal experience, but you're really gonna learn a lot about me now. Um, so I also, um, I created this image called You're a Mother Now. And it's kind of about this idea of like, yeah, you're doing all this work and you're feeling like just overwhelmed and tensed and 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 people say really crazy things to you, like breast is best and pump, like they'll be like, oh man, I'm just not, not producing enough sustenance for my child. And they're like, just keep pumping, just keep pumping, just keep pumping, pump, 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 pump. 
just feel like a machine um, while machines are on you. Uh, and then again, people are saying breast is best or other people are saying like, it's not moral to give your child formula. And so you're just constantly feeling shame. Um, and then again, like saying this out loud and having another human tell me like, well, yeah, you're a mother now. Like, this is just life. Like, get over it. Stop whining. It's something we all go through. I also experienced a lot of, like, just hits, like, strange language that happens. Um, like, I was working one day as a professor at a college, and I was asked um, while I was working um, when I'd be quitting my job. So I'm pregnant. And, the, and it's another woman and another mother. And I, I somehow have this like weird idea that like, oh yeah, if you're a mom, we're probably on the same wavelength, right? Like we probably feel and think all the same things. No. And so I was told that like, well, yeah, like when you have a kid, you should quit your job and you should take care of your child. And that's just what you should do. And I just said, well, then what? what was the point <laughs> like going to school or what's the point? And so, but a lot of times you just have to smile and say, okay, yeah, I'm not quitting my job, but I understand that we all come from different places. So also I, I was like nesting in a way when I was pregnant. And so I, I do this thing where I make a lot of print matter I think my students see it a lot because I make it a lot for them when I'm demoing things is I'll just make a lot of print matter and then it pops back up sometimes. So um, the piece on the left was kind of like the print matter I had been making um, around my students. And then later on, it was kind of fully actualized as um, a growth chart. So these are my son's growth charts. Um, it's really odd. When you have a kiddo, everything is measured. Everything's a number, everything's measured. How much food you're giving your baby, it's almost like a nano pet. You guys are too young to probably know what nano pets are. But it kind of feels like you're keeping a nano pet alive. Um, like how much are you giving it? How much is it sleeping? How much, so you feel like you're not really being seen, but more of just like cataloging, almost like Mary Kelly, right? That's probably why she was making it. I also, um, in 20, was it 2016, 2017? Doesn't really matter. I had been at Gentile residency and I had an artist who asked me to teach her how to make a cyanotype. And I had uh, completely failed at it because I wasn't in dark room. And so what had happened was, and you're seeing a cyanotype is the blue pieces in here. What had happened was I uh, left out my paper to dry and then it had been exposed to light because I wasn't in a dark room and it was failed. And I had all this paper coated and it had failed and it was horrible and I was trying to wash it out and she comes running into my studio and she, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And I, Barbara, it's trash. It's, I failed. And she, no, like, well, I don't even know what true is. Like, I don't even know what good is. And to me, this is beautiful. <sighs> so I kept them and I put them in a flat file for years and years. And then after I had my son, Hayes, that's his name, um, I pulled these back out and I was thinking about like how out of control they were and how it also made me feel really out of control sometimes being a mother and feeling like I needed to control everything but I couldn't and so um, I pulled these back out and it really started becoming like a stream in my, my work. So what you're seeing are reliefs, or sorry, Cyanotypes with um, lithographs are the dots and then reliefs on top, which is printmaking. These pieces are um, dry point on cyanotype. So you're going to start seeing like over and over again, the idea of a house. So 
house home, like for me, house represents an icon, right? Everyone has a house. When they see that icon of kind of a child's drawing of a house, how we first draw them, um, it's like an instant, like, yeah, I know what that is. And then we're also immediately thinking about our own home, our own experience. I also start, well, we'll get there. Um, again, these are uh, cyanotypes. This is kind of the print matter that goes into those uh, reliefs you just saw. But this is the full one. Um, so a lithograph is on the top with the cyanotype on the bottom. So now we get to like what I'm really making. So these are, this is a piece called Perfecting Imperfection. And what you're seeing are um, uh, cyanotypes that are embossed and then made into quilts. Uh, but this is paper. So at the time, I was also, when I was pregnant, I was also kind of, well, before I was pregnant, I was learning how to quilt. Um, but I never thought I'd be using that in my own um, art making process. But then I started um, after I got pregnant and I or had haze. And this is one of the biggest pieces that I had made after haze because I needed to make something fast, which I already had all this print matter and I needed to make something fast just to still make me an artist after having a kid. Um, and so this is kind of the biggest thing that I had made. So, and then after, um, after Hayes or after becoming a mother, I realized that I needed to like drastically change my art making practice. So I, um, I'm really using, really used to working in a print shop or even a dark room where I'm using like horrible chemicals, toxic stuff, big machinery, not really great with having a baby. Um, and I also thought I was going to have the little baby that I would like strap on like a potato on my chest and that we would just frolic around in the print studio and I'd be making all the artwork. That was not my experience. I had like a colicky screaming potato that never wanted to be put up and would never sleep. And so things had to change because I couldn't not be an artist and I couldn't not have my kid. And so I started like looking up, how do I make blue? Um, and then also still use these cyanotypes. Um, so a big reason why I use cyanotypes is because it's kind of a ode to uh, Anna Adkins, who is the first female photographer um, it's also a way that people used to make um, blueprints like for architecture. Uh, and that's again, like where the blue comes from. Uh, and also I'm making houses. So architecture, houses, home, friends. Um, and then I also started doing some natural dyeing and thinking about, okay, I can't be in the dark room all the time. Can't be making cyanotypes and coding. So I have to start making indigo. And indigo is really stinky. So the first time I did it was in my house, not good. So I started doing it outside of the house, which is great with a little kid. Um, also, there's nothing in here that's going to hurt him because I use a 3-2 bath, meaning it's just using indigo, chalk, and fructose, which is like sugar. So if he touches it, he becomes really blue, like a Smurf, which is kind of funny but it's not going to kill him, right? Um, so this is him at about one. And you see me like, of course I'm not just like, ooh, everything's great and easy and I'm an artist now and making work with him. So a lot of times when like that just can't happen, I'm like in the background sketching or thinking, figuring it out, making print matter, making, um, fabric, things that I can do with him so that when I do get to a studio, I can just like run in the studio because obviously I can't do that with him all the time. So this is him at two um, and we're dying indigo together. So it's kind of like an all day experience. And so we can do it as friends. 
So as he turned one, I did my first residency post baby. It was hard, it was rough, I cried a lot. I thought it was like something that I like had to have because it would make me like more of an artist. Thank God it was something in town um, where if I like needed to be next to him, um, I could, but this was also huge because I made so much work in two weeks. They walked in my studio after two weeks and they were like, whoa, like this is, you made all of this in two weeks. So I made huge, these huge, these are two huge quilt tops. Um, and then I hand quilted them after I got done at U-Cross. Um, and so these are, as they're bigger than me. And it's important for me to make work with fabric because I can move it. Um, it's also large, like it can move around my body. And I'm also thinking a lot about how my house or my body is a house, like it housed a child. Um, and so it's important for me that it kind of like moves around my body and that it's a, a part of us. We also think a lot about the quilt as like a domestic object. Um, like you give your child a quilt or a blanket. Right. Um, I also start dying with like avocados and onions, all the smelly things. Um, still using the cyanotype, still using the indigo. Um, I'm also doing it all the time, everywhere. So it's nice. These are my dogs. Um, cause I can do it in my living room if I'm using a small piece. Um, this is a piece of work on paper, um, which took me a really long time. Um, cause I had to hammer out all those little holes with an awl and then stitch it all because paper is way harder than fabrics. Um, yeah. And then I started making this in COVID era. So this is all 2020 stuff. Um, same thing I'm using a lot of times I'll do all my dyeing in the summertime when the weather's good. And then I have like art supplies throughout the entire year. And that's completely planned. Like, all right, this is dyeing year. This is time to quilt time. More 2020. So this is another 20, this is a ode to Vernon Hilla Becker who are topographic photographers um, in history. And they were really famous for making uh, photographs of like water towers in every single city. And so they would just do grids of water towers. Um, and that's what 2020 felt for me and quarantining with a toddler. So I was like, oh my God, how am I gonna make art in quarantine with my kid. And then I was like, oh, this is weird. Like I'm doing the same thing every single day. Maybe I should just document the same thing every day. And so I started shooting my child's breakfast every morning. And you realize that like, I'm really slacking in the breakfast department. And I'm, my child is like solely living off of frozen uh, waffles and cannot sustain him. Yes, it can. So don't you worry. So uh, don't mean to bum everyone out, but this is where things get kind of sad. So um, I use humor a lot to kind of like tamper down. So if you see me like laughing or smiling, like it's okay, this happened a while ago. So uh, Parliament Hill, Hillfields is the first thing I made in 2021. So in September, I experienced my first miscarriage. Um, it was crazy. So it was, um, it was during quarantine, right? It's during a pandemic. So I was all alone, experiencing this in the ER all by myself. Um, my family members couldn't come in with me. Um, and so afterwards I went to work the next day and listened to really, really loud, angry music and just tried to like figure it out. I went and taught my classes 
Um, and I was like, I don't know how I can like reconcile this. I've, I'd never experienced it before. Um, and no one really talks about it, which is even harder because then you feel like you're not supposed to talk about it. Uh, and so the only thing I could do is make work, right? So what you're seeing here is um, dyed fabric. The green is hospital gown. The people at Sheridan Memorial Hospital are so awesome. I was like, hey man, can I keep this as a little token? And they're like, sure. Um, so I got a little hospital gown action. Um, and then you're seeing um, the pockets are made out of my wedding veil. And then the little tea towels of the plate that needs to tinkle, that, those are wedding gifts from my um, my husband's grandmother gave them to me the night of my or the night before my wedding as wedding gifts because women would embroider um, tea towels for their home and so you're seeing like a, a like the time period that I was pregnant um, that's kind of, it's kind of like a calendar so one side of the circle is the moon phase from when I was born, and then one side of the circle is the moon phase from when my baby died. And so they're kind of like in conversation with each other and also tracking um, that, that information. And I didn't want to bum you guys out. So this is the last thing I've made and quilted. It was finished last week. Um, and so all of this is hand quilted. Oh, oh my God, I've left that out. You guys, that's such a big part of it. Um, this is all hand quilted using sashiko thread, um, which is like a Japanese quilting technique. Um, so it's pieced together using a um, machine, and then I hand quilt the entire thing. So, and all of those quilts have been hand quilted and all made in three years. You guys can clap. No, I'm kidding. Don't clap. So this is the last piece I made. Um, yeah. And then lastly, I wanted to end with resources. So these are things that I wish that I had had when um, I was thinking about having children. Um, but my professors never showed this. Maybe they think that you're like condoning pregnancy. I don't know. But the Artist Mother podcast, um, it's just great for anyone, like period, like if you want to listen to amazing artists. Um, they also have amazing exhibitions. Uh, I actually, I'm in one of their exhibitions right now. Um, the Artist Residency in Motherhood, um, that's the one with uh, Lenka Clayton. And you can do that anywhere. You can just type in your information and then put your residency on the map. So you're connected to thousands of other people, which is an amazing community. Uh, Stay at Home Gallery is a great residency and gallery for families, which is amazing. So you can bring your kids and your family, your partner. There's a house and you, it's just great. And they have a studio out back. Um, artist Parent Academic. So again, that's a lot of support, community, the Sustainable Arts Foundation shows a lot of like, like grants and um, residencies, and it's really just a great place to find information about being a parent and artist. And then lastly, the Cal Art Institute, which again, they are a artist um, residency where they also, they also have one for veterans um as well as uh parents and then they have a they also like will have art classes for your children um and like actual programming for your kids while you're working so that's that thank you You guys, I kept that at 45 minutes, like on the dot.
Hello. Oh, that was wonderful, Brittany. Thank you so much. That was fascinating, and that time just flew. <laughs> um, but it is 10 up, so we do have a little bit of time for questions. So I can hop back around and come walk around the audience and see if anybody has a question for Brittany. And Jake will monitor our, our folks at home and see if, uh, if those of you watching from Zoom, if you have any questions, just put them into the chat, and we'll be sure to monitor that and get your questions asked. So let me come around. Getting my steps in. Questions from the peanut gallery. Oh, we have one in the back. Brittany, what is your, um, it, uh, why is it that you use indigo so much? What's your draw to using a lot of that color and indigo? Yeah. Well, thank you for asking. So firstly, it was like, I needed to get as close to a cyanotype as possible without making a cyanotype because I was still kind of referencing that architecture, like, bridge um and then it just turned out to be just like god falling in love with the color blue i mean i've been making blue things for three years now can't stop um but it's also just like really safe so there's other things that take like tannins or iron or things that make that deep color shift um, and you can also use iron with indigo um, but I needed to be able to make something really deep without using toxic things and being able to do it with my child. So indigo was kind of like that next step. Thank you. Other questions? We do have a question from online for Brittany. Uh, it's actually from Rachel Anderson. Uh, but she asks, what are you reading right now? Um, great question. So I, and I think she's probably doing that because that's something I ask artists. She's like sticking it to me. Um, <laughs> so I'm reading Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, I'm also reading a book called Blue It, B-L-U-E-T, about the color blue. I'm also reading The Secret Lives of Color, which is all about color. I'm also reading a ton of books about, it's called The Natural Dyer. And I'm the worst because I'm not gonna tell you any of the authors of these books because I am reading too many and I am awful. But, um, but yeah, the big one is That Natural Dyer. And it's just like a recipe book of dyeing. That's the main one I'm reading because I'm gearing up, it's starting to get nicer. So I'm like ready for the dye season. Oh, another question. Hi, Brittany. Um, so since you use the smaller home symbol, the house, mm. do you ever see if your family gets bigger that the house of that symbol will change or maybe even get bigger? Ooh, that's a great question. And maybe you just help me make my next body of work. Um, I've thought a lot about making like bigger or different symbols. The problem that I'm coming or the problem I'm starting to work against is that I'm like, yes, fabric, I can go as big and tall as possible. And then I forget that like, but like galleries don't always have really tall ceilings. Um, and so I need to start being very cognizant and careful of that. So like making, like it, I'm so blessed to have a studio here at Sheridan College where my, my uh, studio ceilings are super high, but it also gives me like a false idea of like what a normal ceiling is. So hopefully, but gotta be careful. I have a question. Actually, I have a comment and a question. I was very impressed on that the food series with all the waffles that you had fruit in every every picture so <laughs> you're one step ahead of the 
favorite game in my book, at least. Um, I am wondering, as Hayes is getting older, if it's changing sort of, you know, your relationship with your kid and affecting how you're thinking about motherhood in your art. Because, you know, there, he sort of made it through, I, well, far, far from me to say, but, you know, that like hectic craziness of that, the major adjustment of like no child to, you know, the very young years. But as he gets older and he's a little more independent, is that, how is that impacting your, your work or have you thought about that? So right now it's harder because it's like, I can't just like put him in a bouncer or put him in like baby jail, like those gray co baby holders. Like I can't just like, like leave him somewhere like a burrito. Like, so now it's harder cause he wants to be in it. And so that's tough in a way cause he wants to be a part of it. It's also a really thin line where like, Right now, I'm trying really hard not to make work of him, if that makes any sense. Like, I don't want his identity or his version of himself to be out in the world without his control. So, like, it's, I, I think it would be hard, like, in Mary Kelly's case, like, where her kid's being documented in that way. Um, or even like it's been brought up over and over again, Sally Mann's use of her, ch her naked children in her photographs, which by means I think they're gorgeous and it was so important for me to see those images. I've also just, am more interested in how motherhood is affecting me and not so much like my, like my child's identity. That's probably like way more intense, but something I think a lot about. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else real quick before we? Uh, we do have a question from the viewers at home, Brittany. Uh, do you find that your relationship with your husband has influenced your role as a mother? And I suppose as an artist too. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing I'd like to sh like shout out to is um, we strive really hard to, like my husband is like, a maker in his own way he's like a mechanic he likes to like like kind of farm and ranch and like shop work and so I think we're trying to find that balance of like okay you still need to make I still need to make um but at the same time like I'm so thankful there's a lot of single mother artists out there um I also have a ton of help like let's be I have to be totally honest my family, like my mother-in-law came for when I was doing that residency um, at UCross to help with my child. My mom comes on weekends and is like, you have your studio work. I know you need that. So I come up from a family that is really like fosters that need and understands that need as me being an artist. And for that, I am so lucky. Yeah. So big shout out to my family. <laughs> anything else from the viewers at home? Nothing at the moment. <laughs> All right, anything else from the viewers live tonight? Okay, well, I, I'm not gonna run up around again, but I would like to thank you again, Brittany, and I present thank you, you with a certificate that I will reach up and hand you. <laughs> what? <laughs> so wonderful job. Excellent lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Shoot. And um, I just want to say, now that you're here and in this wonderful space, we do have some upcoming events I want to share with you. So this Sunday at 4 p.m. we have our Sheridan College Bands concert and it's free. Um, so right, right here in this space and currently in our gallery, we have works by Kristen Surratt and um, it's pretty incredible. It's op I, Well, it was open. I think that might have closed by now, but it should be open on Sunday, so you can come and hear the concert and check out the gallery, but the gallery is open uh, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., so, uh, and then lots of other events coming up in April. It's a really busy month for us, so you can check out our website, sheridan.edu forward slash arts, and you can find all sorts of good stuff. Um, lots of it is free, so we'll hope, we hope you come back. And please join me in thanking again Brittany Denham for the wonderful lecture this evening.